From the world of the Vampire the Masquerade tabletop RPG comes Nihilistic Software's Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, a fun, story-driven and delightfully violent role-playing game. You take the role of the dashing crusader Christoph Romuald, whose crusaderish exploits are curtailed for a rather ill turn of fortune. And then he finds himself in Prague, having been nursed back to health by Sister Inezka here. As he rests and recovers in the convent, the night is suddenly profaned by the depredations of diminutive demons. Grievously wounded and stumbling, you can still dispatch these with ease. Well, relative ease. Mysteriously restored to full health the next morning, you start your first mission, to clear out the silver mines where the demons are entrenched and from which they terrorise the city. To avoid giving away that many spoilers, I'll just say that shortly after this you become a vampire, as the title of the game suggests. There are two main parts to this game, the first in Middle Ages Europe, slicing, beheading, burning and ensorcelling assorted foemen. The second is set in the 20th century, first in London, then in New York, slicing, beheading, ensorcelling, shooting and incinerating assorted foemen. The main strength of this game is in its story and characters. Let me get one thing out there right away. I despise the extent to which vampires have become brooding sex symbols in mainstream media these days, and, with one obvious exception, I'm none too fond of the caped stereotypes either. The vampires in this game, however, and particularly the protagonist, are neither. Kristoff is very much a man fallen from grace. At the start of the game, he is, in his own way, a man who has everything. He is a proud soldier of Christianity, his faith is unwavering, and he's a hero to those around him. His self-worth and conviction stem entirely from his religion. He is also blessed with a swoon-worthy accent and a chin of quality. Stand, sir, or wouldst thou arrive in hell squatting upon thy arse? That might have been a bad example. When he becomes a vampire, that worth and conviction initially seems to have been destroyed. In his own eyes, humanity's eyes, and, he's assuming, God's eyes, he is now a demon, banished from all that is good on earth and denied heaven. Through no fault of his own, he is suddenly condemned, Unlike some I could mention, when Kristoff broods, he's actually got a reason for it. Through all his misery, however, his conscience, faith, and love for the mortal, Ish, and Eska endure, and he never lets his feelings overwhelm him. Throughout the game, you're often tasked to rescue innocent townsfolk who would, under different circumstances, probably be glad to see you burned at the stake. And every misery bestowed upon him doesn't stop him trying to find the woman he loves, or lend his sword, or minigun, to the cause of righteousness. You're also shown a significant amount of character growth from your protagonist as well, as he struggles with his new identity and attempts to seek the title of redemption for wrongdoings he has done, wittingly or unwittingly. Foremost of these, of course, being endangering Inezka through his less than holy attentions. In game, there are a number of more choices available to you which affect your humanity rating, which is basically a conscience indicator. During the course of your adventures, these choices may seem rather inconsequential and underplayed, but they all play a part in deciding which of the three epic and markedly different endgames are available to you. You are given a variety of interesting henchmen, from the ruffian pink to the wolf-like Eric to the cadaverous Serena from the grave-themed Cappadocian clan, and others. Each have their own strengths and weaknesses, and the complex levelling up system allows you a great deal of control over your party stats as well as the other abilities available to them. There are also no small number of memorable NPCs providing missions, exposition, and sporadic comic relief. I'm not Dev, no. I'm a stalking panther closing in on my prey. A stalking badger. Now then, give me a bit more omnipower. And so on. The world itself can feel a little constrictive, with areas being locked until such time as your tasks require you to go there. In the four large cities you experience, only a handful of streets and buildings are accessible. Similarly, the game is almost entirely linear. You go where you need to, slice who you need to, retrieve the plot device and return to the quest giver. There are never any side quests and no enemies outside of those standing between you and your objective. Returning to prior locations offers nothing but empty spaces and that jacket you discarded on the floor when you found a niftier one. In each town there are two different shops you'll make frequent use of, a blacksmith's, or gun seller in the second part, who purveys arms and armour, and an alchemist's shop, or equivalent which sells spells, amulets, artifacts, and blood. The potential realism of grim battles to the death may suffer an arguable hairline fracture, however, should you magic yourself to safety, pop down a local arms merchant, restock on bullets, and return, 
but it is a necessity in no small number of battles in the game. The gameplay is fairly straightforward. Click to attack, click in a slightly different fashion to cast spells, click to walk over there, click to seize an enemy and drain the lifeblood from his stroke, etc. As the story unfolds, you'll invariably find yourself having to storm assorted dungeons, castles, sewers, temples and the like, fighting through several floors before confronting some manner of boss at the end. The gameplay can feel a little repetitive at times, but when presented with a variety of interesting enemies, pleasantly detailed scenery, copious amounts of loot, and gritty combat which can feel more than a little satisfying, particularly when heads fly off from the necks, there's a good chance that you'll feel more than enthused to fight your way through to the end. There are also a wide variety of spells to liven up combat, all of which are powered by blood. Not your own blood, of course, but whatever you've happened to have ingested on your travels. To that end, there are a number of handy pedestrians wandering around in public places who can help in that regard. Be wary of the loitering guardsmen or police, however, who may feel inclined to sally to the defence of whoever it is you're eating, should they notice you. Curiously, however, they don't seem to care if they see you running around the streets armed to the teeth. Ha! Fun. Fortunately, however, there are more straightforward ways to obtain blood, be it free packaged or purloined from an enemy, or even courteously donated by party members who might have more to spare than you. It is also advisable to be engorged on blood because this holds at bay the beast, the animal within, so to speak, that can turn you into a raging ne'er-do-well, and turn you against allies and enemies alike in a mad frenzy. With the exception of certain boss fights, combat feels very balanced in the game. Your enemies can be equipped with arms and armour comparable to your own, and if they're vampires themselves, they can feast on your blood or even fall fatal to the beast themselves, which does make them easier to kill. Dealing with certain bosses will often require strategy, the application of a choice sourcement or long distance bombardment for example. Charging forth will probably earn you nothing more than a swift decapitation. Vampire the Masquerade Redemption is a fairly old game and has been largely overshadowed by other RPGs over the years, not least of which being its own sequel, Bloodlines. Nevertheless, it remains a fun hack and slash adventure with an expertly written and very involving story. The game is available for a reasonable price on goodoldgames.com and I strongly recommend it to any RPG fans in search of a classic, 